everyone. Hello, it's Naomi Wolf of Daily Clout, and I'm so excited to be joined today by Suzanne Gallagher, the Executive Director of Parents' Rights in Education, and someone who has helped to, to launch the organization along with others way ahead of the curve um, of what is now a battleground for parents and, stu and students and uh, school boards in America. Welcome, Ms. Gallagher. Thank you so much, Naomi. This is going to be fun. I appreciate your uh, featuring our organization. It's our pleasure. Um, and we, we appreciate, I should share that this is a sponsored campaign. We're honored to have you and we're delighted to let people know what you're doing. So, uh, you know, let me start with kind of the um, misconceptions. When I was only reading one stream of media, I thought that people fighting for parents' rights in education uh, you know, battling school boards to have a say in what their kids were learning were, I'm, I'm just gonna be honest, were really benighted troglodytes or they were homophobic or they were, you know, racist. Um, and I, and that's how, how groups like yours can be represented in, in some of the mainstream media. Tell me what your actual mission is. And if those are misconceptions, please tell me why. Well, I do believe that that's a misconception. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, school is for school. We're focusing on academics. And our mission is to ensure that public schools are safe environments for all students, inspiring and uniting all students as scholars. Public schools today have strayed from academics. I mean, it's obvious. They've removed art, drama, and other humanities, you know, as well as access to practical life schools, you know, including, um, you know, introductions to trades. And, you know, parents want their children to be learning all day long, right? not just a portion of the day. So, so to, to jump in, thank you so much for that. So yeah. one of the things I learned in talking to you earlier is, and it shocked me as a step parent of a 10 year old, as a, you know, parent of now big kids, but it would have been shocking when they were little, is that less and less time in the school day goes to academics and more and more to what could really be considered like, you know, advocacy groups um, or kind of social engineering. And whether I agree or don't agree with, you know, those advocacy groups, I do agree as a parent that school, as you say, school should be for school. It should be, you know, the whole school day should be about academics. So tell me, are, are kids actually losing hours of reading, writing, arithmetic, humanities? Absolutely, they are. And they are spending time, uh, just recently, I have examples if you're interested, but they're, they're even involved in political demonstrations during the school day. Wow. So, I mean, that is, a, that is an extreme. And we, also, we always have to recognize that we're not, we cannot put every school system, every uh, school district, every single school into the same pot and say that well, all teachers are this, all schools are this way. And no more than we can say that all parents are the same or all students are the same. But one thing we know for sure, and that is that school, public school is for all students. And, um, and so we have to keep that playing field neutral as, as when it comes to, you know, things that are not academic, things that are straying away from the core responsibility. And when I say that, about the responsibility to teach students uh, academics, things that they can use in later life and teach them how to learn uh, that means they have to know how to write. They need to have to know how to read. I mean, all of these basic things to empower those students to be successful. And I, we believe as an organization that that parent, this is what parents want, and we're learning from feedback from the community uh, and all over the country, feedback from parents that that's what they want. Yeah, they want, they, that's what they expect from school. And so they're always kind of astounded mm -hmm. at um, feedback that they're getting from their own children, from the teachers and from the administration. Uh, you know, I have to say it's it's a bit shocking. I just want to share a couple of examples from my own life, if I may, because I know you know the origins of them. Um, I have a young lady that I love and she was educated, you know, and 
And I said, happy 4th of July. And she said, oh, this country. And oh. right. And then I looked at kind of what she'd been learning about. And I'm a big believer in learning about, you know, the history of racism in this country and the history of the civil rights movement and the history of oppressions. Mm -hmm. All of those are important. But I, I also believe students should have a you know balanced view of history. And she wasn't learning about, you know, America as a melting pot, America as a beacon of freedom, America as, you know, the, the innovator for so many liberties uh, that, that put horrible things in the past. So that's number one. And number two is, um, I, oh, it's just so shocking. When I hear what kids are learning about that you told me about, a lot of those are discussions that I think parents should, okay, I mean, this is another example. I am a feminist. I don't believe in sexism, but I want to be the one to teach that ideology to my kids, right? And so when my, I, my daughter came home from school once and she had a, a book saying, girls are unequal, girls are treated unequally, girls are told they can never be what they want to be. I'm like, and that was the first she had ever heard of that, right? We had raised her yes. beyond that. And I saw right. the, like the way they were teaching it was a blow to her confidence. And I was like, you know what? That is not the role of this school to tell my daughter she is always going to be less than in a you know systematically discriminatory environment. I don't want that burden on her psychologically. That's not my version of feminism. And, and I just want her learning how to learn. So is that pretty much the distinction you're making between oh, academics versus social concerns that are really in household decisions? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, I have similar personal experiences um, and not so not as much with my daughter, but my own personal experience being raised in a family with all boys. I had three brothers. My mom was raised on a ranch in Idaho. She was the youngest of six and the only girl. Hmm. Wow. So between my two parents and, and their backgrounds and being raised with boys, there was I didn't even think, you know, in any remote fashion that I that I was any different as far as my capabilities my choices in life etc than the boys I was raised with right so exactly. this whole notion that you know and so when you're right it's all about the approach right. it's all about the approach and so our presentation of history our teaching of history should be factual but there should be no um oh, burdens put on right. our children, <laughs> you know, it's about so their difficult. possibilities of, of becoming whoever they want to be. And, but, you know, Naomi, that's, this is kind of a new notion that's crept into the teaching of history. And, um, and now we're hearing about it in relation to, uh, to race. And that breaks my heart because we're hearing from parents all over the country, and these are minority parents who are just they're so offended and they're saying we we have never taught our children that they are oppressed I mean and their best friend is is you know white is Caucasian and and now you're you're quit pitting one group of students against the other children is instinctively are not uh, they don't discriminate they well, have me, lots of different this, friends. This is, you've, you've, you know, you've grasped the third trail there. I mean, that, you know, the whole <sighs> issue of how race is taught in schools is a real mm -hmm. political hot potato. Mm -hmm. And the way you're talking is kind of reassuring to me because when you say you want kids to get fact-based history, you mm -hmm. want the civil rights movement to be taught. You yes. want slavery right. to be taught. Absolutely. Of discrimination or you know with gender you want the fight for the vote to be taught you want you know the struggle for women to get political rights to be taught you're not saying don't teach the you know the the ups and downs of history it does sound like and this is where i completely agree with you and i'm so glad you're teasing this out i want my daughter to be taught facts about how women were oppressed and even how they are oppressed i don't yeah. want her to hold who she is 
by the school. And it sounds like you're saying the same thing. Our kids should be taught about facts and history. They shouldn't be told who they are or labeled as, you know, you're African-American, therefore you're this. You're a woman, therefore you're this. Or you're a girl, therefore you're this. Is that pretty much what you and, and the parents you work with are saying? Because I'm, I'm- Absolutely, I'm because I mean, we're all Americans. Just these labels, I mean, the, the it, it really, uh, it's very divisive. Uh, it, and, it, and it puts ideas, like you say, it does affect our children psychologically and, and in a case where they never even thought about it and, and not, not just to the, the, the labels that we're talking about here, but any kind of association that is placed on children individually. Now, I have an experience, if I might share that, with my grandson who at... Uh, Let's see, I think he was eight or nine, okay, third grade. Uh, this is a social emotional learning um, uh, program and, and uh, teaching that was done. I think it was in four separate weeks. And so each week they took a different topic. And this particular week they're, they're talking about what's a family. And then they literally did ask the students to stereotype themselves. No. That, I'm not kidding. And that word, Naomi, like threw me. I thought, I can't believe I'm reading this in print. Now, I have the document that came home from school, from the teacher, uh, you know, saying that th this teaching was going to be taking place. And my daughter-in-law, I said, gee, you know, you should volunteer to, you know, be in the classroom that day, you know, during that time. So you can witness what's actually being taught in the discussion of the children, because we have a right to be in the classroom. Uh, the teacher refused to allow her to be there, even though the very next day, she said it would be disruptive. The very next day, uh, she was going to be volunteering in the classroom. Anyway, okay, so the next day I said, why don't you just go this day and help her in the classroom then? Well, bottom line, you know, they're putting into the kids' heads that, that they should be analyzing themselves and one another and, and, and actually stereotyping. So Excuse me, I think that is inappropriate. It has yeah. nothing to do with academics. And, uh, and it, they're taking up time. That well, children should be learning uh, facts, figures, um, actual you know information that will help them uh, to be you know to be more better equipped. So let me. So I, I think we can all agree on that. So you know you. It, so it sounds like you're not saying if there's a discussion of a, you know a novel and someone wants to talk about you know. LGBTQ rights or someone wants to talk about racial right. discrimination that that should be censored you're not saying that you're saying kids should not have top-down ideologies that are divisive labeling them and taking up time in the school day is that a fair summary of what you're saying yes. thank okay. you thank you now let me yeah. jump to the bigger picture all right okay. um because I'm just gonna you know call it as I see it your you know, we were so happy to have you and Parents' Rights in Education as a, as a sponsored campaign because we are hearing from parents across the country who are shocked and astonished at what is kind of the, the weaponization of school boards. And, it, you know, we all know about Merrick Garland, you know, calling parents who speak up at school boards domestic terrorists. And on December 7th, I've been invited to go here in Columbia County um, in upstate New York to a, a school board meeting where parents are told they have to be masked, they can't speak for more than three minutes, and there's an armed policeman, you know, there. And we're hearing about intimidation and bullying of parents, doxing of parents, which means disclosing their information. In Virginia, there was that horrible case of like a family's livelihood being threatened by another family. Uh, we've heard cases of families that are Trump voters, um, you know, that, that parents disclose them to the school board to kind of get the kids out of the schools. I mean, and That's this- in Oregon. Yes. And <laughs> yeah. But my, my, I guess my point is sitting here where we're hearing from all over the country, uh, kind of similar, very un-American, not organic to us, um, kind of takeovers of school boards. 
And, and also that, you know, parents being told you can't go into school, like who, when is a parent told they can't go into school, right? Never, like never, or you can't go into school till you've had a PCR test or, you know, like a real dividing of parents from their kids and from the school process. And, and that's why I love your organization name. Anyway, this is just a long way to say, you know, what's the big picture of what's going on? Because I do, we, we are seeing huge flows of money to certain people on school boards. We're seeing conflicts of interest on school boards. And it seems like there's this targeting of children. And I think, you know, I think there are a lot of people are benefiting from it that are adversaries yes. certainly yes. to create a divided, ignorant, disempowered, um, you know, generation of kids, but also uh, communities, right? Because it, it's the school community that used to be one of the strong locuses of community in our country. So I guess my, my big question is, what is the big picture that you see? Okay, love that because it hasn't happened overnight. It feels like that, but it's been going on for decades. But in recent years, this has really come to what I call a head. I mean, it has, they, they have things that, that we have known about uh, that were going on uh, in relation to school board elections and uh, the relationship between the elected officials and uh, for example, the superintendents and the parents, as far back as the early 90s, uh, was evident that school board members were told, even though maybe we elected people that represented us that we thought would be you know, great uh, um, individuals to represent our interests on the school board, we go to the school board meeting and they'd say, oh, well, you know, we don't read curriculum. You have a problem with curriculum? Oh, we don't. We don't read curriculum. We hire experts to do that. And one one dad stood up at this particular uh, meeting and he said, "Well, excuse me, I, I'm you know I'm confused. Uh, you know, you we elected you, and uh, you are to represent the community and represent, of course, the parents in the room. And we have a concern about curriculum, which is the heart of a school. What our children are taught, right?" Okay, we're not talking about the tr new track or the swing set or anything like that. This is the heart of the school. And if I have a question or a concern about what my child is taught, I should be able to come to the school board and voice that concern and get some kind of resolution. Absolutely. Right? Because they yes. should answer to us. They work for us. Yes. And I've heard that recently by a lot of parents, you know, at school board meetings. And they're, and they're exactly right. right. I mean, they're technically exactly right. 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 When I talked about this, they're not bosses of parents. They represent right. parents. They're elected by parents. Yes, they're, they're elected, elected just as elected our parents. other elected officials are, Naomi. And you know, you go to, you know, I testified in the, in the Capitol and been to Washington, D.C. and talked to my representative. And, and, and that's the way our nation was designed. And it's a fabulous design. We love it. Right. But what has gone wrong? And so what, when, when we're working in this arena, we need to pay attention to where is the power and how can we act and how can we affect, how can we affect public policy legally? So that's uh, the solution. Let's get to that in yeah. a minute. Okay. Sorry. Okay. But who are these people mm -hmm. wanting yes. our curriculum to disempower our children and okay you know, I, yeah and I love that question because I'm always asking when I went to a school board meeting the very first time I sat there thinking who are these people well number one we don't know who our representatives are on the school board in many cases and maybe they're not in our camp but yeah. first of all we go to that meeting we wonder well why aren't they listening to us because they have been uh told um <clears throat> either directly or indirectly by the superintendent who is influenced by the school board association in in uh, the state uh -huh. in the local state so the school board association they go to those meetings and they they are very um oh friendly and welcoming and encouraging and they tell these new school board members you have local control oh okay. so okay, then so the real tell part them that Who's funding the school board associations at the state level? Who's funding the school board association? Okay, so the school board association, uh, they're friends with um, 
the teachers union. So I'm just going to set that aside. They're friends with the teachers union. We know that because of the letters. So now we have it in black and white. Now we have it in writing. The National School Board Association in conjunction with, in partnership with the, uh, the uh, National Education Association, which is the teachers union, wrote the letter, okay, that was sent to President Biden. This, we reported on this, okay. Then almost simultaneously, the president contacted the Department of Justice and said, we've got to do something about this. These parents are causing problems. So you've, you've okay. yeah. So let me just jump in if I may. Uh, sure. Like what you've just said. I think it's very important. It, it answers a lot of the mysteries of what we're seeing. So having been a political consultant on the Democratic side, I know that um, the school unions, the teachers unions are supporters of the Democratic Party and they're big donors to the Democratic Party. I know that Rochelle Walensky met with the uh, teachers unions, you know, in hammering out these CDC power grabs in relation to our kids and everyone. And so what you're describing and, and more investigation needs to be done, but my instincts from what you're describing is that there's, they've turned into political entities probably mostly on the Dem side, I'm sure it goes both ways, but they're not neutral representatives of parents, which is why it's so important for parents to run for school board, right? That's but, right. But, and, and I'm guessing, because millions of dollars have gone from the Gates Foundation to K through 12 education, I'm guessing that you're gonna see nonprofits flowing money, you know, with consultancies or, you know, support or, you know, two foundations related right. to these, organizations. So basically what you're describing is that a lot of school boards have representatives that are have pressure or alliances with outside interests, political interests, muddy interests. They don't represent just the parents. Is that exactly kind of like summary? Exactly. Yes. And so these individuals, and of course they're we do know that they're that they support them financially. Uh, during school board races, that they're that they're backing mm-hmm. candidates, even though, uh, and these candidates are nonpartisan, right? They're nonpartisan. These are nonpartisan races, right? But the teachers union does get involved, uh, directly or indirectly, and they support candidates. And so, often, can I just say I think that's a conflict of interest. I don't think they should, because. <laughs> Well, it is a conflict of interest. Appointing the fox to guard the hen house. The the, the school board should be overseeing the teachers, not the teachers overseeing the school board. Okay, go ahead. That's shocking. Okay, well, thank you. And 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 we have um, we have many examples of that. Um, that that you know we, we could we could spend all day talking about that fact and that teachers now teachers unions are becoming very bold and in uh, Newburg, Oregon, uh, to the extent that they are uh, they they are going against the newly elected school board. So there is a they new a newly elected school board in Newburgh, and the and the majority we're talking the majority on the board passed a policy to. Um, require uh, uh, on permanent display in every classroom two flags and those two flags are the United States of America flag mm-hmm. stars and stripes right. and the state flag that's it but no it's other flags radical. Are, it's <laughs> radical no other flags are to be displayed with those two Why? that's what used to be in my classroom in the yes. 60s when I was growing okay. up Yes, and you put it to the flag because it's a government school, Naomi. It's a government school. Okay, so what would be more natural? No, at a private school, it probably would be very similar, but maybe they would add, uh, if it was a religious school, maybe they would add um, the Christian flag. But let's keep it simple and straightforward and not confuse our children with political messages, which is what was happening in this particular district. And they ran on a platform stating that that we, we want to remove the politicization of our students from the classroom period okay they ran on it and they won and they did it and they did it now here's the next thing okay i'm going to use this as an example Uh, there are many more and i know there are a lot of people watching us today who can relate to this Okay, so you get your school board elected, and, and that's, of course, what we encourage all parents to do. Our, our goal is to empower parents, not to hold their hand and tell them exactly what to do, because 
we believe that they're smart. Yeah. They understand this instinctively. They're very smart and they are willing to do whatever it takes um, legally. Okay. We don't want anybody, you know, <laughs> doing anything illegal or goofy or anything like that. We want them to use the process appropriately. Mm -hmm. So they get their, their, um, their candidates elected and then they go and, and, and uh, pass a policy that is within the law. Okay. Right. Right. And now all what, of how do they implement right. that policy? Who right. works for who? Right. Okay. How do they implement it? So what happened is the school board implemented the policy and within moments, the community just erupted and all of the activists, you know, got involved and uh, they, they went after, in fact, right now they have collect, collected enough signatures, barely enough. Uh, because this is the majority, remember, that, that's serving on the board now. But the other side is going after them uh, to try to, to recall two of these board members, two on of the board. I mean, I guess you could say fair enough if that's democracy in action, but what's the what's the basis of the recall? Because they're saying they're they're bigots and they're racists. Because they want the U.S. flag in the classroom. Now, on that note, <laughs> this is getting fun, isn't it? So on that note, <clears throat> the teachers union has become involved in, in, that, uh, uh, in that district. Uh, many of the teachers are uh, very, um, uh, they, lean, they lean toward the National uh, uh, Education Association and, their, and what they are promoting. And, and so as a result, they have taken it upon themselves to declare that they can do whatever they want. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a, this is a huge story. In this Newark, Oregon is a huge story. It, you could not write a script, Naomi, as explosive as this real life incident. Now, okay, guess what else? So now that the superintendent is not implementing the policy, the superintendent basically just didn't do anything, okay? And so now the teachers are removing the American flag, the U.S. No. flag, from their no. classrooms. No. Yes. And going against the board. Okay, so what did the board do? They went, well, we have no choice. Our superintendent is not uh, following the direction of the board. The superintendent is hired by the board and is supposed to do as the board requests. Right. As long as it's legal, you know, right. and, and reasonable, certainly. I'm not asking you know them to like pay what happens in every classroom or anything. I mean, this is crazy. I get it. Next, so uh, because the superintendent does not go along, the board was compelled and had no choice but to fire the superintendent. Yeah, great. Okay, so what did he expect? He's yeah. not following the board's policy. No, I gotcha. Is that the, the next end of day? Oh, well, no. literally within a couple of days, and we have photographs. The um. The superintendent went physically, went to the schools, to all the schools, hung out with the students, had his picture taken, holding BLM signs. Was that the sign that was considered politicization? I can see why it would become a racialized discussion if that was the sign that they were trying to remove. That was one of the signs that they did uh, feature in their classrooms. Um, so, so here's the thing. I mean, we're talking about Say he, high like, school. he has the right, in a, you know, First Amendment, he has the right to be photographed holding a BLM sign. I mean, we do want a, a country in which everyone's expressing their opinion. Right? But, but just a minute. No, I'm going to ask you, does he have the right? Because now he is not a functioning superintendent of the district any longer. He has been let go. And well, he has the right in a private capacity, of course. Not, I mean, he doesn't have the right to... At, you know, in a, in a school capacity to do anything. Because exactly. He can, he can write letters to the editor. He can, you know, do whatever he wants to on his own time. But that was just an expression of rebellion, if you think about it. So he's going around to the schools and doing that. Then, yes. you know, and now, now they're, they have, um, they, they have a fundraiser. They held a fundraiser to raise money uh to remove these two uh, board members you're telling a story about right um, how a community has been divided um by the politicization of the classroom so that some 
parents and kids are battling for some signs, other parents and kids are battling for other signs, and even the US flag and the state flag are considered political speech and people are fighting to remove them. So what I'm hearing is a big picture of division. And so whoever's behind manipulating school boards in this way wants this kind of chaos and division. This is not America, right? When I was growing up in the 60s, all the problems of the 60s, you know, we were being taught this is a melting pot. We are all equal under law. After 1964, we were all equal under law. And um, there wasn't this kind of uh, divisiveness in school. School was not a political space. And so now you're saying it's been politicized and people are being divided. Is that right? And so, well, yeah. And let's keep in mind one very important aspect of this. Okay. We're talking about, okay. I want everybody to remember, we're talking about K through 12 education. Mm-hmm. We're talking about minors, say for a few kids, you know, turned 18, you know, in the second half of their senior year. Alrighty. Mm-hmm. So they do not vote. These are children. They don't vote. Okay, so so they should be learning history. They should be learning civics. Absolutely. They should be learning all about our government and right. how it works and what is appropriate and the role of a school and the role of uh, the role of their government. Who to vote for. Absolutely. Right. But but when it comes to opinion, that's a different story. Unless it's on a debate stage, you know, unless it's part of the curriculum of the classroom, that that's a different story. But when yeah. we're talking about K through five, yeah, no, I filling it, classrooms it, it, with political flags, etc., it's not appropriate. And the teachers have taken license to, uh, uh, like this teacher said, she said, "I've been teaching here twenty three years." I know what my kids, and when I hear that as a parent, if I were a parent and my and, and my kids' teacher is saying they're her kid, it's her child, my kids, I know what my kids need. I want know what my kids want, and I'm going to do whatever I want. You can't make me do something differently. Now, if as an employer and a business owner, which I have been, um, that doesn't work for me either because they're somebody has to be in charge of of order and fulfilling the um, requirements and the policies that the school board, which is a governing body representing the people, uh, sets in in, in tomorrow. No, absolutely right. I mean going back like leaving aside the the you know rights and wrongs of what's being put there, the bottom line is how does our democracy function? And our right. democracy functions school, I mean School is local. That's how it's set up. In, in, yes. you know, in Europe, there are national, you know, curricula, but in our system, school is local and school boards are elected officials that are supposed to represent the needs of the community and the community decides what their kids learn. And that's always been the case. So yes. you're describing kind of, you know, unfortunately you're describing a, the same kind of federal overreach or centralized overreach uh, into the local and state arena and Yes, slate of rights that we're seeing in other areas. So this has been super enlightening. So I know everybody watching wants to say, how how do I get involved? If they agree with it, how can I help? And so, you know, how do people support parents' rights in education? Oh. What do we do next? What's the what's the goal? Okay. Right. So we need we need parents and local citizens to join us to uh, to go onto our website, go to the join us page. Uh, fill out the form. Now, when you fill out that form, you will you will receive our emails. Okay, so we want to get you plugged in with our information. If you want to join others, uh, we invite you to do that. Start a local chapter in your school district or in your county. We don't care how you you know what what region you want to represent or if you want to lead a whole state. It's all wonderful, but let's plug you in and get you working with other parents to take our schools back at the local level. What is the correct website for people to go to? It's parentsrightsined.org. Okay, wonderful. So everybody, you know what to do. Sign up for parentsrightsined.org. Reach out to Suzanne, whatever state you're in. If you go to her website, you'll see that there are many states in a drop-down menu where you have tailored information. Run for school board. Uh, You know, lead lead your community. Um, Get together. Don't let don't let these things happen to your children without you taking back the power. Uh, Suzanne Gallagher of Parents' Rights in Education, thank you so much. What an enlightening conversation. And we'll keep following what you and your wonderful community of parents are doing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
Take care.